So Newtonian mechanics works really well, but it doesn't work um, when we've got large velocity motions, and that's where special relativity is needed. So I'm going to try and give you a flavor today and Thursday of special relativity. We're only scratching the surface. Um, so some of the topics we'll try and get through today are up on the chalkboard, and all as well on Thursday, we'll, this is basically kinematics, we'll also extend our um, discussion to dynamics and talk a little bit maybe about sort of momentum, energy, forces a little bit. Um, but again, we're just scratching the surface really. It's not intrinsically a complicated, in-depth topic. Um, the difficulty with special relativity arises for almost everyone because it's conceptually very different from our daily experience. And so it's hard to adjust to that. But it's actually based on just a couple of very simple premises and everything else builds up from that. So a kind of um, forewarning, it's going to be confusing, it's going to be conceptually unfamiliar. Um, the sort of problems we'll be dealing with are going to be not too complicated, um, but again, it's easy to get a little bit unsure of what's going on. Um, I've not found an easy way around that. Um, I still find it not particularly conceptually comfortable. Uh, so we'll see how you get on. Um, for those of you who are going on to do more physics, um, this is indeed a sort of starting point. Um, relativity generally, we're talking about special relativity this week. Um, 
Relativity is obviously important for many aspects of physics, so it's important that you have a solid understanding of special relativity. General relativity, sort of a bit more of a standalone topic. Um, I'm not certainly going to ask you in this course any problems, questions about general relativity. But of course, as you've seen on this homework and potentially on the final, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, there may be some sort of simple level problems on special relativity. Okay. So that's the content for today and a little bit into Thursday, turning our attention to housekeeping matters with it being the last week of classes, a few things to talk about. Um, everything this week is on the regular schedule. This week um, is the last week where the full recitations are running and as you know of course the TAs are keeping a note of attendance because that's going to factor into overall score and grade. So this is the last week for which that's, that's true. Um, it's likely next week Alex, Ben and Reese, if they can be available on a more limited basis, and it's up to you if you want to go, but probably they'll be available on some of the times where we regularly have recitations, just for you to stop by and talk about whatever you like. So that's likely to happen, stay tuned. Um, Again, everything this week's on regular schedule. I have yet to figure out my availability for next week and the week after. And just a reminder that the final exam for this, uh, for this course is fairly late. It's on the Thursday morning, which I think is December 20th. I'm around, um, and so we'll try and make myself reasonably available for any help, questions, whatever you may need during those two week periods. Once I know what my schedule looks like, a bit, more, a bit more than I do right now, I'll announce that. Uh, a few weeks back, I told you about review sessions, and we scheduled those for next Wednesday afternoon. My recollection is 2 to 5, but I'm not exactly sure. And the following Thursday morning, I think that's from 9 to 12, the hours are up on your coursework's calendar. Um, pretty sure it's in here. Again, I think that information is up on the coursework's calendar. So these are going to be me, rather than the, uh, the TAs. Um, and my goal is to try and cover what I think is important for the entire semester in three hours. Um, it's roughly the same in both iterations, so there's no need to go twice unless you're a masochist. Um, <laughs> and the reality is, I've learned, though I've tried to do this different ways over the years, the reality is there tends not to be a lot of actual problem solving in those, re in those reviews. There's simply not time. I will try in every step to outline the techniques, the methods, the strategies we've developed through the semester. I'll try and reinforce those as we go. And of course, there's plenty of time for you guys to ask questions. Um, but in general, it doesn't allow for working through full problems. Um, so I just want to make sure you have a heads up about that. Final itself, um, probably eight problems, seven or eight, I'm guessing eight. Um, and as advertised throughout, about half of them on the new material since the second midterm, and the other half on the older material. There's been a final up on coursework for a while. Um, let's see, what else do I want to say about this? I haven't done this recently, and it's when it's most important. Um, I will try and get up by the end of this week a summary of any sections of the chapters that we've covered that you don't need to know. And again, we've been selected not much, but to the extent that we have been selected <coughs> just in the past couple of weeks. Um, so I'll try and make sure it's very clear about what I want you to know for the final and what you can ignore in terms of content of the textbook. Um, and my notes um, by the end of this week. Um, okay, let me pause and ask you questions on that stuff. Are we out there for the I think they're in here. I know we have a room set, I just can't remember. Um, if any of you can look on Courseworks right away, I think the location is posted. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so by old, I mean up to and including midterm two, and new stuff since then. A little louder? Okay, so it is in here. So the reviews are in here. It's Wednesday afternoon and Thursday morning. Okay. 
Any questions on stuff over on this side? Okay, so if we try to this point. Okay, uh, I ran out of space. Um, so let me come over here. Don't do anything until the end of class. Um, these are those um, midterm twos that were submitted to me specifically for um, looking at that second problem with the um, rotating rod of the thing that's kind of ejected off of it in some explosive way. Um, and so for those of you who used a little, um, used kinetic energy conservation as an approach, I've gone back and I, this is not easy, as you know, um, I didn't quite know how to handle it. So I've gone back and um, added a few points at most. It's not much, as I promised it wouldn't be, because it's just not appropriate. Um, but I've gone back and added a few points for those of you for whom that is applicable. So after class, if this applies, please pick up your blue book there. Um, there are other a few more regrades from midterm two that were not relevant to this. Um, I just got them back from the graders this morning. I want to review those before returning them to you. Um, and those other regrades will get back to you on Thursday morning. Okay, um, and then again, coming back to special relativity, um, just uh, I'd say somewhat unusually, um, I'm not, as you know, a big advocate of you reading carefully the textbook. I mean, it's fine to read it once, maybe a second time at some point if you're unclear on something. Um, special relativity, simply, simply because it is a little bit conceptually confusing and is counterintuitive. Um, it's probably worthwhile reading this chapter of the textbook carefully, okay? Um, and slowly and thinking about stuff as you go. Again, it's not intuitive always. Um, and there are, as always, some reasonably well selected in chapter problems in our textbook. Again, this chapter I think merits you devoting some time to those resources. And, of course, throughout the semester, at least after the first couple of weeks, you've had the practice key sets. And again, this is a, a chapter, a topic where I think it would really be useful for you to go through those. Um, they tend to be more in the way of introductory, leading you through some topics that tend to be particularly apt to misinterpretation, misunderstanding, so I strongly encourage you to work through that practice. He said for chapter 37. And then lastly, these are a couple of comments just for those of you who have particular interest beyond what I'll cover in class today and on Thursday. There's a very nice kind of, sort of this level, maybe slightly higher, introductory text on special relativity, space-time physics by Taylor and Wheeler. For those of you who are going on to do more physics or are just interested, um, it's a really good resource. And I haven't mentioned this throughout the semester, but as kind of we're getting towards wrapping up phase, um, primarily I would suggest for those of you going on doing more physics, um, the resource, the Feynman Lectures on Physics, um, very well known, very well liked by a certain demographic, and I need to explain that. Um, Feynman, of course, was a, a fairly legendary physicist and also a very good uh, teacher. He was very adept at explaining particularly complicated things in ways that a lay audience or a semi-technical um, audience would find interesting and useful. Um, so these, these were based on introductory undergraduate physics courses given at Caltech some decades ago and fairly soon afterwards made it to a lecture series that you can now gain full access to online so you don't need to worry about buying these. Um, so they're really interesting. Um, actually, the special relativity chapter is maybe not as interesting in the sense of providing a different perspective as many of the other chapters. Um, but it just struck me now as a good time to mention these. Um, so I said for a particular demographic, they tend not to be a recommended resource for first-time intro physics exposure. They're sufficiently different in their approach, and maybe somewhat unorthodox, that they could be confusing, um, since they're different than many of the things or approaches that we've maybe addressed. But for those of you, again, who think you might be going on to do more physics or are interesting, interested in just in sort of seeing a novel perspective on many, many things, uh, Feynman Lecture is a great resource, okay? So I thought I'd just mention those two things for those of, uh, those of you who may be interested. All right, 
questions on anything before we talk about special relativity? Yeah. As we go through the special relativ relativity like PowerPoint, will you like specify like what is, is most important for us to like take notes on or? Yeah, um, so I'll post these online. Okay. Um, so in that sense, we don't we'll need to worry about writing stuff down. Um, I'll certainly try and go through it. I'll try and go slowly. I'm, the reason I never use slides in classes is a temptation to go too quickly. Um, so I'm going to try and go slowly here, um, just to kind of emphasize the things that are important. Um, but they'll be online later today. OK, anything else? Good. OK. Let's pretend we're at the movies. I should bring popcorn on Thursday. Let's see. Yeah, that's maybe too much. Alright. Let's go with this. Um, okay. So, um, mixed bag of things um, that I'm going to talk about, possibly in a slightly different order than you'll see in the textbook, but of course they're all very much uh, related. Um, We'll start off talking about the so-called postulates of special relativity. We'll go back and talk a little bit about ideas of observers and reference frames, the sort of vantage point from which we're observing, measuring things. Um, I'll talk a little bit throughout about the idea of things that are invariant. So, um, oh boy, it looks like we're having a little breakfast recovery going on here. Um, <laughs> keep going, keep going. I, I just for the first time I'm noticing fruit loops all over the place. Um, okay, so <laughs> uh, we'll talk about invariance. Um, that's something we haven't spent a, or put a lot of emphasis on in first semester physics, but it turns out that the idea of invariance and things that don't change when something changes, sounds like a slightly cryptic comment, but the idea of invariance is very um, strong in physics, it has led us to a lot of new insights, and so we'll talk a little bit about invariance along the way, and barely at all, but again another extraordinarily powerful idea that's been very successful in physics is the idea of symmetries. So symmetries and invariance are two concepts that have been very powerful in physics. So we'll talk a little bit about um, the postulates. We'll talk about some sort of changes that we can play around with and see with certain sorts of changes, maybe even sort of just geometrical ones. If certain things we can identify don't change when um, something about our geometry or coordinate system changes. Then we'll move more specifically towards um, relativity. This topic at the bottom, which has relativistic kinematics, we'll only touch on today, possibly not even, with the Lorentz transformations. Um, and then the remaining stuff we'll talk about on, um, on Thursday. OK, so as I said in my introductory comments, this is a broader uh, framework that works more generally and correctly describes motions of objects when they're moving very quickly. Um, and a reminder that our daily experience is a very special case. And as with anything based on human experience, it's very hard to shake off what you experience in your day-to-day -day life and imagine a world that is totally different, okay? But keep in mind that we are strongly constrained by human experience and where possible, if we can free ourselves from those constraints, um, that's helpful and will often help us make progress in understanding the natural world. Um, so everything else on this page I think I've said, I'm not going to dwell on it, let's start talking about some actual uh, content. So the first thing that um, becomes important in special relativity is connecting space and time. And already when I say that, um, you know, for most of us, that's not a particularly obvious thing to think about. 
we tend to treat space and time as really quite radically different things. Um, and certainly that's been how physics has developed. So in Newtonian physics, space and time are really quite distinct concepts. Um, so some of the ideas that we may be carrying with us have certainly have largely been reinforced by our Newtonian mechanics, which in some respects might be viewed as a pedagogical mistake. Maybe you should start out teaching the most general things and then worrying about special cases later on, but that's hard for introductory physics to start with special relativity. So in Newtonian mechanics, we've kind of gotten used to the idea that somehow time is a universal. It's just something that exists, that we can measure in some way, but we have no influence on. It's something that is kind of there, and that's it. And that's very much the sort of Newtonian picture. So if we take in the Newtonian picture time as being a kind of given, and sort of rigid, and fixed, and even worse, perhaps, um, universal everywhere, a kind of useful thing or having said it's useful, I'm immediately going to throw it out of the window, is to imagine something a little bit like this cartoon on the right-hand side, which is to try and imagine objects, motions, in a space-time representation. Now, you're very used to using space-time representations with some spatial coordinate along one axis and a temporal time coordinate along the other. We do that all the time in Newtonian mechanics. So now we're going to take that idea and extend it not just to one spatial um, dimension, if you will, but to two and ultimately three. And really we care about three. So if you look at this sort of cartoon on the right hand side, since it's hard to represent um, three dimensional space, x, y, z, in addition to a fourth time coordinate, what I'm doing on that cartoon is killing one spatial dimension, let's call it z and simply showing two spatial dimensions, x and y, in the horizontal plane, and time moving onward as I go from the bottom to top, okay? So you can imagine kind of cutting slices here, and at any given time, you're looking at an x, y plane, an x, y coordinate system, and you might be pinpointing where an object is on that x, y plane at that given time. So that white line that runs from bottom to top is basically a trajectory of an object. So at each time slice, it's got an xy coordinate, you go to the next time slice, maybe it's moved, maybe it hasn't. But that line, white line basically describes a trajectory. So of course, if I could represent this in four dimensions, I would, and then I'd have a fully three-dimensional space, x, y, and z, and the time coordinate going along in a fourth dimension. So in this sense, space and time are very different, but we can relate them when we're describing motions. Okay, um, so certainly we are used to objects moving in only one direction in time, that's to say time moves forward, whatever that is. Um, and that's something we're really not going to touch on when we talk about special relativity, that directionality doesn't change. However, what will change um, is the possible ranges of speeds or velocities that objects can have. Now, in this Newtonian picture, we've never really given ourselves a fundamental speed limit. So the idea is that objects can move as fast as they want, if that's the word to use, or as fast as they are being inclined to make, make move. Um, so, again, in our Newtonian picture, there's an idea that we can have objects move with any velocity, and we're going to throw that out of the window in a few minutes. And then lastly, this is something we'll talk about um, fairly soon in class this morning, um, we are going to have to think about what we mean about things happening at certain places at certain times. Um, and Related to that, the idea of two events, we're going to use this sort of concept of events quite a bit, two things happening, um, the idea that they may be simultaneous um, is pretty easy to define in this Newtonian picture where time is universal. But in special relativity, the question of simultaneity and asking whether two events happen at the same time or not is a little bit more complicated. And it turns out it's going to depend on how we're moving. Okay. So these are some of the sort of things that you have very much embedded, I expect, for most of you in your 
um, sort of human experience way of thinking about the world, and we're going to have to change some of them. Okay, so, sort of before and after set of um, uh, criteria or conditions, maybe. So now in special relativity, um, you see I've started already, and I did on the previous slide, I've started to sort of contract space and time into a single concept, space-time. So you see this slide is after space-time. Um, one of the most important things special relativity tells us is that space and time really do need to be treated very much on a sort of equal footing. Obviously they're not the same, but if we can treat them on an equal footing in some way, that's going to be helpful. And so we're going to combine them together in this concept of space-time. Um, and unlike in our Newtonian picture where we somehow have the idea that once I've sort of got an idea of what time is, not easy, but the idea that I can have a universal clock and time is the same everywhere, we're going to throw that out and instead replace it with an idea that somehow time is a more local phenomenon. Um, so I'm not going to say any more about that right now, but sort of I want you to keep that idea in the back of your, your, your minds. And very much the same point, but said in different words, I think, is the idea that there's really no absolute notion of all space at one moment in time. Okay? So this is something that I still am wedded to, the idea that I can think of all space at one time, but it, it's just not the correct way of looking at things. Okay. Somehow we need to factor in some of the different aspects of relativity. Okay, um, and as is probably one of the well-known things about special relativity, what we do find now is that there's a fundamental speed limit, so to speak, and that fundamental speed limit is determined by the speed of light in vacuum, okay? Um, what do we mean by this? Um, and this is often the source of a little bit of misunderstanding. Um, what we really mean is in its most fundamental form that I can think of is there's a fundamental speed limit on how information can be transferred. And um, that sounds a little abstract. Um, and certainly there's a fundamental speed limit on how quickly a macroscopic object or even a microscopic object can move. And so the speed of light in vacuum is our fundamental speed limit according to special relativity. I keep saying the speed of light in vacuum, that's a little bit of a detail, but I do just want to remind you, maybe not a reminder because we haven't explicitly covered it in class, but I'll tell you if not a reminder, that while the speed of light in vacuum is whatever it is, 300, 000, no, 300 million, 3 times 10 to the 8, 300 million meters per second, um, light actually can and does go slower in materials, okay? So when light enters some material, and presume it's a transparent material, um, it will slow down, and it can slow down very significantly, okay? The speed of light in vacuum is our fundamental speed limit, three times 10 to the eight meters per second. Um, and then, I'm, I think I'm not gonna to say too much about this cartoon, because it's a little bit abstract right now. Um, so, if you take anything away from that little cartoon on the right-hand side, um, the only thing I want to think of, or not even think of, but recognize is there's a phrase called a light cone, which hopefully we'll have time to come back to. Instead, I'm going to draw your attention to the thing at the bottom of this slide, which is now the new idea that observers, pairs of observers, let's say, um, may not necessarily agree on um, when things take place. And this will be the fact that here, particular simultaneity, is the idea that things are taking place at the same time as we observe them. And we'll see pretty soon um, that this idea of simultaneity is something that is more um, subtle. It's going to depend on how people are moving relative to each other. So a lot of things that are abstract and unfamiliar, and it's both of those things that tend to cause a little bit of um, conceptual difficulty with relativity. All right, so I've already used this um, word event. Um, there's a sort of few pieces of jargon, they're relatively simple words, so hopefully not too, too bad. Um, but there are a few pieces of jargon that appear throughout special relativity. So an event, okay, not a very profound definition here, but maybe good to be precise. 
is simply something that occurs at a specified point in space at a specified time, okay? So when we're talking about an event, that's what we're talking about. Um, an observer, some body, something that's making observations, describing events, and I'll sort of interchangeably throw this back and forth with the idea of a frame of reference. And if you think back to early in the semester, we introduced this idea of reference frames in Newtonian physics as well, which is basically just a way of saying, okay, this is kind of where I am, this is the coordinate system that I'm using,